let's uh, let's get started here. So uh, I think uh, we had actually a really good transition, A, from the previous talk um, involving Redockly. I'm a big fan of Redockly, and I'm going to reference them a little bit here today. Um, but also the initial question of just what's trending? And what I really want to get into is how through new tooling, through automation, we can design APIs with that specs first approach, or as I like to say, the API product cycle when you're treating APIs like a product problem. And uh, we'll get into that in a moment. Um, so we just get right into the slides. I have to first handle that one slide, my most hated slide, the about me slide. Um, but basically, I've been uh, doing the API thing for a little over 12 years now out in Silicon Valley. Uh, I've been at some some well-known companies. What I'm most well-known for is uh, is Box. I was the first successful product to hire there and the founder of really their whole developer program, uh, the first full-time hire for their developer platform. So I was on the ground at PM for their APIs and over time built out a platform team to manage that API ecosystem. Uh, ever since I've worked on APIs in a good mix of companies, some of which you may have heard of, most of which you probably haven't heard of, uh, but some success, some failures in enterprise software and education technology, even in drones and the commercial space industry. Uh, that includes TradeShift, that's another billion dollar company in the supply chain. I've also been an advisor, a mentor, and consultant for many, many companies um, through, um, through places like uh, Salesforce Accelerate, an accelerator for companies that integrate with Salesforce and Heavybit, an API-focused accelerator. Basically, I've been working on APIs for a long time. I've seen a lot of things work and not work over my 12 years. And as mentioned, I'm seeing some good trends finally in consistency and standardization automation to set the good standards for APIs. And so that's really what I want to get into today. I'm going to start with a little bit of talk of the early history of APIs and how we got to this point that we have automation. And then what really is that API product life cycle um, and what are the tools to help you with that? Then also where we are today, but where things are going, what else we can do to see things further automated for that better developer experience. But I'll start off with the hilariously ugly history. Uh, and let's talk about APIs, especially those web REST APIs before the days of Swagger and now open APIs. Um, back in 2008, you know, REST was a concept that was already out there, but we didn't see it too often. It was um, just kind of tricky to implement. It was just getting thrown around, and people were just creating APIs freely, just you know, knowing that they needed to create functions, generate stuff in XML, and and that was it. So, you know, long story short, it was messy uh, back in 2008 when I was you know starting working on our APIs at uh, at Box. And by messy, well, I'm being diplomatic here. I mean hideously ugly, actually. It was really, really rough. Um, for anyone, by the way, who's ever had to work on SOAP APIs or in FinTech and supply chain in, in EDI, uh, there's actually this API meetup group I discovered just for you. Um, it's actually a group therapy uh, session, the set of group therapy sessions just for anyone who has PTSD from working on APIs back in the day. But moving beyond SOAP API, some of you are familiar with the history of SOAP. I don't want to go that far back. You can look it up. Um, when you got into REST APIs, uh, APIs seem simple to implement, but they weren't really being implemented well. And that was partly because we didn't have standards well adopted. Uh, initially, REST APIs were based on XML, not JSON today. And there was actually something. A WADL that um, was a standard to say if you create a schema in WADL, you can auto generate documentation. There's like a standard for how to design REST APIs in XML. Uh, unfortunately, it just, it really just wasn't well liked. It wasn't well adopted. Most people simply didn't like WADL. Now, part of that was that people just didn't really like XML. So a few things happened. JSON happened. Uh, which completely crushed XML APIs. And then Swagger came along, a way of saying that we can have some sort of a standard definition 
for those simpler APIs. Uh, I love seeing the comments here, uh, people joking about SOAP and also bringing up WSDL. You know what? Um, WSDL, in my opinion, wasn't the worst thing about the SOAP API because SOAP, long story short, was a very heavy API, difficult to design, difficult to utilize. But WSDL at least said you have to define your API under a schema, under a standard. And to some, that was annoying. But on the other hand, if you get organized, if you get consistent then in your APIs, there are benefits. And we saw the benefits when we moved to a lightweight, easier to set up API through JSON. Uh, and then Swagger coming along to say, now we have something that people are comfortable adopting. And we have a good value proposition to say, if you build your, your JSON-based APIs with Swagger, we can just make certain things easier for you. You create your Swagger file, and your API documentation gets auto-generated for you. Great, now we have an incentive to go and create something in a schema. And in the process, we're gonna design our APIs in a RESTful manner. I love seeing RESTful APIs because now you have these, besides it being easier to build APIs, you have those API aggregator tools, the MuleSofts, the Zapiers of the world that can easily connect APIs. And it's much easier for them to do that when APIs are fairly consistent. And JSON with Swaggers enable it. It's become easier to build APIs and the tools are there to create a structured API with the benefit of say, better documentation. But there's a lot more we can do than just automate documentation. We can also generate better documentation than the sample that I showed and we'll get to that, although Redockly has proven that. Um, but once you have something like Swagger, now open API, what else can you do besides uh, generating the documentation? All these other tools in the community started to come along, highlighting the benefits of using a schema. Uh, for instance, there's the just, you know, when you actually write your code, you can comment on your code and auto-generate, you know, the Swagger schema from your code. So as you write your code, hey, the documentation can automatically be updated. Sounds great. Also, you know, database schemas are well-structured. Swagger is well-structured. How hard should it be to auto-generate an API off of your database? Well, turns out it's not very hard and a lot of tools start to come along to automate that. So these things are great to see, but as a product manager in the world of APIs, I had also noticed a concerning trend that the first set of tools for automation with Swagger, well, they weren't actually encouraging the sort of API design that we've seen in successful APIs. Generating open API schemas off of your code, generating APIs off of your database. You know, in the previous talk, we noticed the issue of doing that. You're not, you're then writing your API before you're actually creating the open API schema and documentation. And that's where, you know, just as we've talked about in the previous, in the previous session, on uh, the previous talk, uh, how, how they mentioned, um, you know, the schema first design. As a product manager, I'm emphatic about that. And so what I want to get into is API product management and then how there are automation tools that help with that. And not necessarily the tools that make your life easier if you're, you know, coding the APIs first and documenting them. How are you going to utilize these tools for that proper API product lifecycle? And I'll start with summarizing what is the API product lifecycle. Um, I teach product management courses, and I'm not about to get into too much of that in the time that we have here, but to summarize what I've seen as a source of many unfortunate failures in API world, uh, which I've also seen as a failure in product management in general. And that's this philosophy of if you build it, they will come. Once you build a product, people will just come and start loving what you've built. It doesn't actually work in practice. In fact, where this line comes from, it's the movie Field of Dreams, where long story short, the people they attract are actually the ghosts of these White Sox players who took a bribe to throw the World Series. Uh, when you think about that, uh, if you know about this movie, you realize that maybe that, that philosophy, even in the movie, doesn't really bring you the customers who you want. 
It's not just build what you think is cool and magically everyone's going to start using your product. This hasn't worked anywhere else in product. And for some reason, I still frequently see this philosophy in the world of APIs. The general deal for product is you have to understand your customers, what are the problems that they have, then come up with the right solutions for them and build to that. And very often product managers learn it's not what we think it's cool. We have to understand our customers. In the world of APIs, it's the same thing. Know your developer community. What are your partners trying to build? And then how do you make it as easy as possible to build that? I've seen companies who've built out elegant RESTful APIs um, as an example in the world of supply chain and in invoicing. To create an invoice, it should take one API call. But um, by building REST APIs off of their internal infrastructure, it took instead half a dozen API calls to generate an invoice because those internal tools are meant for efficiency. They're not meant for what the external community wants to do, which is just have these functional APIs. So as a more structured approach to the API product lifecycle, um, if we look at the top here, this is the general cycle for product management. Identify the problem, understand your customer, do your research, get an understanding of the problem. Then we're going to come to what can the solution be. And then we design tactically the solution. Then we go into actual implementation working with our developers only after doing our research. Then we actually have to handle the launch and post launch. We need to maintain our product and we also need to continue to learn and iterate. So let's look at this product life cycle um, from the, in, in the world of, of APIs. How do we do this when we're building solutions for developers? Okay, we have to identify those value points for our partners, for our developer customers, our developer community. When I was at Box, we found several value points for our developers. In some cases, Box provided a feature solution. Um, Box, by the way, it's kind of like Dropbox. I hate to say that. Don't tell marketing at Box I said that. But basically, it's a way to organize your content online. And so we could provide a content management solution to partners who would bring us users. There were other partners who were instead building complementary tools to Box that Box would then promote through our sales team to our customers. Um, so in some cases, companies were trying to provide solutions to existing Box customers. In other cases, Box provided a solution. Over Twilio and Stripe, it's companies need a payment solution. Developers need a messaging solution or a video chat solution. Uh, and then it's, okay, they're going to build to your APIs to do that. How do you make it as easy as possible to design those APIs? Let's look into more. What are our customers trying to do? Maybe there are other APIs that are worth benchmarking. Check out schema.org or their standards. Will our partners want a GraphQL API or a REST API? Then we can actually, once we have a better understanding of what sort of APIs the partners want, our developers want, we can design our APIs. And that's where the open API schema actually comes along. Um, we first understand our customer, then we design the open API schema, and then, yes, we build to that. And then, of course, we have to manage the actual launch. This is where Redocly is going to come along with not just documentation, but they're working on that developer portal and beta now and managing that experience when you've actually launched your API. Let's dive deeper into this now and see how there are tools out there going beyond just generating API documentation off of your open API schema. I'm sure many of you are familiar with a lot of these tools. I'm trying to organize them alongside the API product process. Moving away from the let's generate an API off of a database into the if we're applying the API product cycle, what fits with design, research, implementation, um, launching. And so these are the kind of tools that come up. You'll notice that some of these tools are about creating the open API schema, and then other tools are about utilizing the open API schema. Let's dive into a few of these tools. So starting off with that research and design stage, before we actually have an open API schema, how do we actually design them? Well, we've seen Swagger Hug, 
uh, stoplight, Kong purchased insomnia, basically the IDEs. They're making it easier and easier to actually write your open API schema. Most of these are about just letting you know if your schema is valid or not. Um, but we're starting to see some more tools around this. And I'll get to those next generation IDEs in a moment. Uh, during this time, once you've, well, actually, once you've gotten your APIs plan out, what can we do to simplify development? Um, I've seen a lot actually happening now in the world of the API gateways that they want to accommodate open API more. So once you have your open API schema, you can just plop it into the gateway and the gateway is going to know how to set up in the reverse proxy structure. What are the endpoints going to be? What are the errors going to be? So the gateway may be able to even handle many of the errors that, so that your developers don't have to code them. So during development, the gateway plus schema makes it easier to get this thing built and launched. Uh, I've also seen some attempts even generating server-side code off of your open API schema, not just generating API libraries that I'm sure we're all familiar with, but to actually try implementing your APIs, have some code auto-generated. These are, let's just say, in beta. Um, I've seen them over at Swagger Hub, the server-side code stubs. I think they need a lot of work, and we'll get to what else we, we might be seeing there in time. And of course, there are tools like Postman for API testing as well during the development phase. So going beyond design and development, when you actually want to launch your API, it's about having that solid developer experience. Here we know sometimes the developer experience and developer support is more important than the API design itself. So Swagger started with, yeah, you can generate API documentation. And thanks to businesses like Redockly, we actually have well designed, well, nice looking API documentation. That first default Swagger documentation, I'm sorry to say, it was pretty ugly. I'm glad they had it, but I'm much happier seeing Redockly come along and say that that three column API documentation that's become the standard for a quality API, you can just auto generate that now off of your open API schema. And we know that there's more to the developer experience than just documentation. Let's get into that developer portal. I see now that Redockly has in beta its own developer portal. Kong has one, Apigee has one, um, Amazon, the AWS API gateway, they sort of have one, but honestly, it's pretty half-baked right now. Um, this is something that I've seen trending over the last year and a half, two years, which I found to be vital. As a consultant, um, when companies needed, clients of mine needed to have an open API schema, uh, sorry, when clients of mine needed to have a developer portal, I would just reuse the same designs, the same wireframes every time for every client and just rebrand it for them. Uh, and I let them know about this, that I saw there's this pattern in what you see in developer portals. So why can't this be automated? Why can't we maybe just have a WordPress, a WordPress plugin that you know plugs into your API gateway? And now we're starting to see more of this. The API gateways at the center of all this are building out these complementary tools like the developer portal. Or places like Redockly are just providing the developer portal for you so you don't have to be dependent on your API gateway and, and what they want to design in your portal. So there's the launching of an API and having that good developer experience. There's more to that, obviously. The API libraries and SDKs, we know that we can auto-generate those. They don't often come out great, but we're starting to get there. And then also the mock servers, uh, Stoplight's Prism, so developers can easily interact with an API on, on um, just test data right off the bat. And the lovely things about this, you'll see, is by working with Open API, you can automate not only the generation of these, but the updates of these. So we have the developer portal, we have the libraries now, we have the mock servers, everything you need to say that you have a pretty elegant developer experience now. Documentation with APIs you can whip up and test quickly. All of this now gets automated. And so I look at it from the API product cycle, but I also like to look at it as like a tech stack. What are the tools stacked up that you can use to create 
that good developer experience to manage API development and also make sure the developers externally are getting what they need to see. And here's a sample of that covering development to launch. When you look at this from a tech stack, engineers also start to see the whole CI CD thing. You know, when they make an update to their codes, so there's one new API endpoint or a new property in the API. Yeah, then it can automatically get reflected in documentation. It can automatically get reflected in the developer portal. And you can even auto update your API libraries and SDKs accordingly. That's really the dream automation to generate good content, but then also making it easier when you're providing these updates. And doing it, not just in a matter of updating your code and updating your documentation, but making sure you have that solid design built first. Once you have that solid design, that solid developer portal, then you come back to CI, CD so that those little updates do get automatically reflected. So we're now seeing with all these tools that you can be good with the API product cycle. Um, start with the open API schema and then build from there and create from that an elegant API. And these tools are helping with that. But as I've jokingly kind of criticized at a few moments in this talk, these, these tools are still in progress. Many of them are in beta, even um, over at Redockly, they have tools they acknowledge to be in beta. So what is going to come next to automate this even more and make APIs better? And I want to look at some small iterations, but then also those bigger iterations, the better opportunities for um, even more solid developer experiences over time. And let's take this to, let's take this opportunity to not just, you know, critique what we're seeing in the market today. Um, there are some small iterations, obvious iterations, but also opportunities to try something riskier, bigger, those larger innovations. As an example here, um, I hope this is visible, but if we take a look at an open API schema today, um, there are many components to the open API schema, but in general, at some point you've defined your, your central models, your components, um, from which there are other functions referencing. Like for the pet store, there's going to be a pet object, and then you want an endpoint to create a pet, to edit the pet, to update the pet, to delete the pet, to view all your pets. Uh, you know, the common, as we call it, CRUD operations. And so you start to notice when you're actually building your open API schema, you know, it's very common for developers when, when or PMs when we're designing our open API schema to first write what the functions are going to be and then write what the models are going to be. But if we actually do it the other way, start with the models, it should be possible to auto generate those functions. And uh, I actually whipped up for fun uh, a side project here. Feel free to take a look at it. Anyone who's interested uh, offline and critique it, but I whipped up a page and a simple API where you just send over an open API schema that is just the models, just the components, not yet the endpoints, and it auto-generates the endpoints for you. 80% of the time, this thing provides the endpoints that you need. Um, and this actually allows me to write only like a fraction of the open API schema manually and generate the rest. So we're generating the open API schema here but still through that design first approach. Let's take a look at the IDEs as well. Something I always love to do when working with YAML or JSON is abstract the interface on top of it. Let's not just have IDEs where you're typing in your schema. Why don't we make it visually easier to plan for your schema? Stoplight and Swagger Hub are both starting off with forms. You can just say, here's the info I need for my model. Here's the kind of function I want. And the open API schema gets partially generated from the interface. Uh, Kong, I think, has gone, gotten to be a little bit more creative. I hope you can see this thing, but they've created a mapping tool. Um, what they actually like to do in this case is connect to you know, some existing tech you have, your database schema, to generate this interface. But they're allowing you to still manually create, map out visually how you think your API should work. And then from there, 
generate your API off of the open API schema. So I'm looking forward to more creative solutions in the API design aspect. Then let's get into more of the developer experience, that launch stage again of your APIs. We're finally in the last couple of years seeing companies launch solutions for the developer portal beyond the documentation, manage the rest of the developer experience through the developer portal. What I've also seen, and I haven't really seen this in the developer portals yet, many, many, many platforms have their own app directory, their own marketplace, Salesforce's app exchange, um, some place where your consumers can come and see all the integrations and maybe even install apps right there. Um, this is another one of those cases where when I've worked with my clients and designed a developer portal with them, if they want an apps marketplace, yeah, I find the experience is pretty consistent and I'm just rebranding designs for them. So uh, Open Channel and a couple of others, disclaimer, I'm an advisor to Open Channel, have specialized just in the app marketplace, the apps directory. So you can build your documentation, you can manage your developer portal, and through tools like Open Channel, you can also automate the management and create the creation and management of your, your apps marketplace. I'm hoping in time to actually see this integrate more deeply with the developer portals, but both of these types of services are still kind of young, and it'll take some time before we see some solid integrations here. Here's another fun one. I want to come back to um, those server-side code stubs that we see over on uh, Smart Bear Swagger Hub today, where you can you know, generate some server-side code to get you started in actually writing your, and actually coding your APIs. Here's a challenge though. You have your open API schema, but how does this really connect to your database? This code, it's very generic. It may just not really work with what you need. Um, and again, this is assuming that we are creating our APIs and then coding our APIs to our database rather than just generating APIs off of our database. Whenever I bring up this concept, people ask me, why can't you, well, you can generate your APIs off of your database? But let's treat this like a product problem. We want to generate, we want to plan our APIs, and then we want to connect it to our backend. Can we automate this more? And there have been some conversations happening here. Um, I've conceptualized this with a few people. I haven't really coded this. If anyone is interested, feel free to ping me, by the way, uh, on LinkedIn or anytime after this, this presentation. What we're trying to do is let you first write your open API schema and then take your open API schema, take your um, database schema and create a mapping between the two. And once we have that mapping to understand what properties from the open API schema map to what properties in your database, can we generate server-side code that actually makes the queries to your database? Basically generate more customized server-side code to auto-generate, automatically manage the actual functionality of your APIs. In the past, I've coded something that can map database schemas to variables in code. And I'm trying to do that here. So once we have that mapping, we can generate that custom code. Again, if anyone's interested in this, let me know, because a few people are trying to get to this point. It's one of those blue sky opportunities. And let's talk about the user experience beyond the developer experience. When it comes to API monitoring, catching errors, anyone out there is encountering this issue, a customer has reported a problem with an integration. Is the problem the partner? Is the problem that user's account that is doing something wrong in general? Or is the problem with your code? Over at Box, when we had an integration with Salesforce, we didn't know if it was the user's account. We didn't know if it was an issue with the Box API. We didn't know if there was some issue, some downtime with the Salesforce API when a customer reported a problem. We would have to go to our developers and they'd have to investigate in the logs. Well, there are tools to make that much easier, better monitoring, better logging. But um, some have conceptualized, this one comes from Mosif, uh, disclaimer, it's another company I advised, to actually integrate with customer service solutions, with CRM. So when a customer reports an issue, 
the customer service rep, while in Zendesk, can actually pull up a Mosif plugin, look into, hmm, who is this user? What is the integration? Okay, we can look up their auth token and come back and say, here's what we think is going wrong. It's an issue in their account based on the API error. Or, no, there's this issue with our API. So customer service can immediately communicate to the customer what's going wrong and immediately go to engineering and say ahead of time, here's what's happening. So this is what happens when you think about automation in the right manner. How do we improve the developer experience and the customer experience? And here's what we can do if we build upon what we've already seen. This can lead to um, a term I'm starting to see. I hope many of you have heard of about this before. If not, I hope you hear this term in the next year. Why do we not have CRM for developers? Why do we not have customer relationship management for developers? Developer relationship management, DRM. I'm starting to see that in articles. I'm starting to see companies advocate for it. Most of has been using the term frequently. That's what happens when we see that we are going to build tools for the better developer relationship. Not just tools to whip up APIs faster, but the tools to whip up better APIs faster. And so I hope that these tools get you thinking, how do I design my APIs better? But also keep a lookout for what may come in the next year or two. And for those of you who are developers, PMs, and additional, in addition to technical writers out there, what can you do to help to make this automation trend better? So that as, uh, to quote Jerry Seinfeld, uh, my job as a consultant, to quote Jerry Seinfeld, um, you know, if all goes according to plan, I'm going to be moving back into my with my parents soon. So I thank you all for taking the, next, the last 30 minutes and putting up with me. But what I really want to do here to summarize is this, let's look forward to this better future where we're utilizing open API, where we're utilizing the other tools, the API gateways, and plugins for those API gateways to see better tools around open API for design, for development, for management, to make it easier for all of us to create that better developer experience. Thank you all again. I think we hit the 30 minute mark. Are there any questions?